Hey, good morning, Rev City friends and family. How are you doing today? Come on, who's glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Let me hear from you. And it's good to be with you. Thank you, Riley. So good to be with you. Appreciate Pastor Eddie stepping in last week, giving me a week off, brought an amazing word. Uh, as such, I haven't had a chance to tell you. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving, even if it looked a little bit different for you. Hope you were just mindful of all the ways that God's been faithful to you and through you and to us, even in the midst of some challenging uh, seasons. Uh, just so much to be thankful for, amen? amen? And I am thankful for you and for this church family. And uh, listen, this morning, if you have your Bible with you, you uh, can you turn to, let's see, where do I want you to turn? How about uh, John chapter 16? And then just be patient. We're going to get there here in a moment. Lots of scripture in today's message. As I begin a, a series, a mini series for, for the Christmas season called The Perfect Gift. And you know, this is a season where if you watch television or you're on Facebook or whatever, you're going to see all kinds of advertisements saying that their product makes the perfect gift. This adult size onesie makes the perfect gift. <laughs> Listen, right now, the PlayStation 5 is the perfect gift for a, for a huge segment of our population, right? If you have a PlayStation 5, I will pay you a $200 premium for your PlayStation 5 because I know there's a place where I can sell it for $400 more. The perfect gift. Our product is the perfect gift. And listen, I want to encourage you this morning that your Heavenly Father is the best gift giver of all time. Amen. And that he, he knows. I, I did some research, and what I found was that they've actually done some studies about what makes the perfect gift. If you go Google it, you can find it for yourself. And one of the studies that I found says this, that the perfect gift is something that someone needs or wants, but is unable or unwilling to uh, to. Uh, purchase for themselves. The second thing that they found that, that has to do with the perfect gift is that the perfect gift will often generate extreme joy, excitement, or anticipation in the giver of the gift. Listen, think about that. Something that you need or want that you can't or won't purchase for yourself. <laughs> think about Jesus. He, he's the perfect gift. Something we desperately needed, and now because we've experienced his love, his goodness, his faithfulness, his mercy, his tender, tender heart towards us, we desperately want him. The perfect gift is when something, when you desperately need and begin to desperately want something. God is the greatest gift giver of all time. Just look at a few of these scriptures. James 1, 17, every good and perfect gift comes from where? Above. Luke 11, verse 11 through 13 or verse 13, rather, so if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Acts chapter 2, 38 and 39. Peter has preached the gospel of Jesus and said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Christ Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. John 14, verse 15 through 17. If you love me, obey my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you, who is the Holy Spirit, who leads you into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him, doesn't recognize him, but you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. It says the world cannot receive him, but the Father is looking to give him. And I just wonder, in this season, will, you, will we receive the perfect gift. Because the gifts don't come with an invoice. Gifts are given freely and gifts must be received freely. And I wanna to talk to you this morning about the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit. Listen, most believers are comfortable with the concept of the Holy Trinity. God three in one, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But listen, when it comes to the Holy Spirit for various reasons, there has become this shroud of controversy or confusion over who the Holy Spirit is, over whether he's even actively involved in our lives today, and about whether or not he's even still available to empower us as believers. And listen, I encourage you with this often, and this is perhaps one of the greatest examples. Anywhere where there is power, potential, or promise, you better expect the enemy to create opposition. 
And if you can't oppose it, he'll create controversy or confusion that has caused a great many believers, even in the Christian church, to shrink back from and maybe just steer clear of or, or step around the idea, the concept, the person of the Holy Spirit and what it looks like to live in a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Anywhere where there's power, potential, or promise, you better expect opposition. And in the case of the person of the Holy Spirit, the enemy has come to bring controversy and confusion. Listen to what Jesus said in John 16, 7. This is a powerful concept. He says, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. This is Jesus. These are red letter words. I tell you the truth. Like anyone would doubt that Jesus would lie to us. He says, I'm telling you the truth. You need to hear this. It's to your advantage that I go away. Why? For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Can we pray and ask the Lord to speak to us today in a fresher, or a new way about who the Holy Spirit is and about the privilege it is to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and about the impact and the power that it brings to our life Father, I thank you for this church congregation. I thank you for every man, woman, every couple, every family represented here, God, every young person who's in this room. And I thank you for your heart, Lord. I thank you for your heart. You're the greatest giver of all time. You sent Jesus as the gift of salvation, and you've sent the Holy Spirit as the gift of your presence living in us, with us, and for us. And Father, I pray today that you would use the word of God. I pray that you would use my words today to reveal your heart concerning the person of the Holy Spirit. Where there's been confusion, would you bring clarity? Where there's been, been controversy, Lord, would you shine a light for what your word has to say, Lord, that, that maybe in a fresh or a new way, we might be able to receive the fullness of the gift, to receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, and come on, all God's precious people said, amen, amen, amen. amen. I'm gonna share with you some powerful truths from God's word about the Holy Spirit. Listen, isn't that what matters? What does God's word have to say about this? And number one is, I wanna encourage you that he is a person. He is a person. He's not a force, he's not a power, he's not a being, he's a person. John 16, Jesus said, we just read part of it, but he says, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Listen, this is important to grasp this, that he's not a power or a being, he's a person. Why? Because he desperately wants a relationship with you. James 4 verse 5 says, do you think the scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? He longs for a relationship with you. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 14 says, may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The grace of the Lord, the love of the Father, and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. The Greek word there for fellowship is the Greek word koinonia. And listen, it expresses, there are different levels. How many of you know there are different levels of friendships and acquaintances? And in a world where we're very common with virtual friend requests and virtual friends, we have hundreds, maybe thousands of friends on these platforms. This is speaking of a whole different level of relationship. It's speaking of intimate friendship. Listen, if, if it was any more intimate, this koinonia fellowship that this scripture says that the Holy Spirit wants to have with you, we'd have to reserve this conversation for a marriage conference. It's intimacy, an intimate friend. It's not just a passing acquaintance that once you knew someone or you went to high school with them or you worked with them or you know his sister or the brother-in-law or whatever. It's intimate friendship. It's oneness. It's the kind of fellowship that he wants with you. Listen, the Holy Spirit is not a means to an end. He's an intimate friend. And the church oftentimes has looked at him as a means to an end. Well, it's the Holy Spirit that allows us to do this or do that or preach the message or do this. Listen, that's all true. And next week, we'll talk about the empowerment and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But today, I wanna to underline that he's not a means to an end. He's an intimate friend. And when you get this intimate friend, he begins to empower you to those ends. But the heart of the Father is that we would have the grace of Jesus, the love of the Father, and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away, Jesus said. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. The Greek word there for helper is the Greek word parakletos. Listen, this is a powerful word. 
It's so powerful in the original language that the, that the translators of the Bible to English could not settle on one English word to sum it up. If you read different translations, you'll see that they struggle to put one word on it. One translation says helper. Another translation says comforter. Another translation says counselor. And yet another translation says advocate. Listen, here's the good news. He's all those things. He's your paracletos. He's all those things. He's your helper. He's your comforter. He's your counselor. He's your advocate. Listen, with everything that's going on in your life, in your world, in your marriage, in your family, in your workplace, how many of you could use someone, a person, to come alongside you and be your helper? Come on. I love Eddie asking us for the showing of hands. How many of you could use a helper in your life? How many of you could use an advocate, someone standing with you, speaking for you, fighting the battles in your life with you and for you in a way that's beyond what you could do in your own strength or your own intellect or experience? How many of you could use an advocate in your life? How many of you could use a counselor, someone to give you insight and wisdom and direction and listen, beyond our earthly insight or wisdom, heaven's own insight, wisdom or direction, how many of you could use a counselor in your life? How many of you could use a comforter, a comforter in the hard days, in the difficult moments, in the unforeseen circumstances, the dark days of life, someone who would never leave you or forsake you as you're walking through those things? How many of you could use a comforter in life? He's all those things. That's who the Holy Spirit is. That's who he is. He's not a being or a force or a power. He's a person. And he's fully God. He's not a sub-God. He's not a minor God. He's fully God. And he, he desires a relationship with you. That's why Jesus said, it's to your advantage that I go away. Can you, can you just grasp that? Think about all the things that Jesus had done in the lives of his disciples and then wrap your head around that statement. He had paid their taxes with a gold coin out of the mouth of a fish. He had fed the masses with a couple of, of, of loaves and fish and he had done all kinds of miracles. They had seen it, they had heard it, they had witnessed it, they had felt it, they had experienced it. And this same Jesus who did all those things and the Bible says that if all the things that Jesus did were written down, the books of the world could not contain them, that Jesus is saying, it's to your advantage that I go away that you might know the Holy Spirit. The one who is currently with you, but one day will be in you. It's your advantage. Isn't that powerful? I mean, it, can you just grasp how critically important it is to break through the confusion or the controversy and really understand that God wants every one of us as believers. I mean, I'm talking to you, man of God. I'm talking to you, woman of God, in spite of where you've been or where you've come from or what you're going through today. The Holy Spirit is for you. He wants a relationship with you. Number three, the Holy Spirit is one of several distinct baptisms that we see all throughout God's word. And listen, some people teach and believe that if they believe in Jesus, if they have Jesus, they don't need the Holy Spirit. Some people teach and believe that if they've received Jesus, they've received already the fullness of the Holy Spirit. But look what God's word says, Acts chapter 8, verse 14 through 16. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. And as soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. Catch this, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. There's a subsequent baptism. Listen, I'm not trying to create doubt or confusion. In fact, I'm looking to bring clarity, conviction, and confidence that you have the Holy Spirit. By the end of this service, every one of you, if there's any doubt, if there's any confusion, there's, a, there's gonna be an opportunity for you for once and for all through, through the preaching of God's word and clarity that it brings to say, I receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I receive him by faith. I appreciate and welcome him into my life to be this paracletos, to be my comforter, counselor, helper, advocate, and my friend. It's a separate, distinct Baptism, Acts chapter two, Peter has boldly preached the message about Jesus, 
who came from the Father, who lived a perfect, blameless life, who offered up his life, who was crucified a gruesome death, who went to, to, the, to the grave, who rose again into eternal resurrected life. He's preached that message in the, the word of God says in Acts 2 that the hearts of the people who heard the message, they were cut to the heart. And watch what they said. They, when they had heard this, they were cut to the heart. They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do in response to the hearing about this glorious grace? But Peter said to them, repent, and every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift, the gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children, and get this, to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. That's talking about you and me. And those who are yet to come to know the Lord Jesus. This gift is for you. This gift is for me. This gift is for your children. This gift is for those in Lawrence, Kansas, who are yet to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But as we live this life and preach this gospel, I'm trusting that more and more people, because maybe it, be, not in spite of, but because of some of the things we're walking through, are gonna begin to say the same thing to you and me. What shall we do? Turn to Jesus, the baptism of salvation. Be water baptized, the baptism of water. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, the baptism of fire. The response, repent, be water baptized, receive the Holy Spirit. Listen, there's a pattern here, three baptisms that are actually all throughout the Bible. First of all, Jesus experienced and modeled all three. First John 5, verse 6 through 8. Jesus Christ was revealed as God's son by his baptism in water and by shedding his blood on the cross. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And the Spirit, who is truth, confirms it with his testimony. So we have these three witnesses, the spirit, somebody say the spirit, the, spirit. the water, say the water. the water, and the blood, say the blood, and all three agree. Listen, on the cross, on the cross, just think about it, these three baptisms, the spirit, the water, and the blood, on the cross, the blood of Jesus obviously flowed down. Do you remember what happened when they pierced his side? The blood and the water flowed down. And do you remember what Jesus did in his dying moment? It says, with a loud cry, he breathed his last. The spirit, the water, and the blood. And all three testify and all three agree. When Jesus breathed his last, Mark 15, verse 38, with a loud cry. Watch what 38, or verse, that was verse 37. Watch what 38 says the curtain of the temple as he breathed his last was torn in two from top to bottom. 39, when the centurion who stood in front of Jesus saw how he died, the spirit, the water, and the blood flowing down, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Isn't it powerful to be reminded about this? And listen, it's not just in the New Testament, all throughout the Bible. And listen, the Old Testament, 1 Corinthians 10 says, was written for our instruction. And watch what 1 Corinthians 10, 1 and 2 says. I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors in the faith were all under the cloud and passed through the sea. Catch this, verse 2. They were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Moses, who is a type of Christ, a deliverer. A savior. Listen, he wasn't Christ, but he is a type, a foreshadowing of Christ. He was the one who heard the instruction and encouraged the people of God to use the blood of the Passover lamb that when it was painted upon that doorpost, dripped down in the shape of a cross. He, he was the one who was used as a deliverer. It says they were baptized in Moses. They were baptized in the cloud and they were baptized in the sea. Through the sea, a prophetic picture of baptism prophetic picture of baptism, all the things in your life, all the things in your past washed away, all the things that were, are chasing you, trying to bring you back to the place of captivity, washed away by the waters of God and in the cloud, which represents the Holy Spirit. Exodus 13, 21 says, the Lord went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud. He provided light at night with a pillar of fire. This allowed them to travel by day or by night. And the Holy Spirit, according to the word of God, is the giver and the bringer, the revealer of truth. He shows you the way in the day or in the night. When, you, when things get dark, when you can't find your way, 
The Holy Spirit is the one who is leading you and, and drawing you forward towards the purposes and the plans of God. They were baptized in Moses. They were baptized in the sea. They were baptized in the cloud. We see this in the tabernacle of God, the plans and the preparations and the order, the construction of the tabernacle of God. These three baptisms were present. Exodus chapter 40, check this out, 6 through 9. Now, this is a little deep, but I think you'll catch it. Catch this. This is powerful. Then you shall set. These are the instructions for how to set up the tabernacle of God, which was the place where the people, the priests of God, would go in and encounter the presence of God. Catch this, and keep in mind these three baptisms. The blood, the water, and the spirit. You shall set the altar of the burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. In other words, the place where the sacrifice was made was the first place that you had to pass through before you could enter into God's presence. Secondly, verse 7, you shall set the laver, which was a basin filled with water that was set aside for ceremonial washing between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. So catch this, just picture this with your mind. There's an altar of sacrifice. Next, there's a basin of water for ceremonial cleansing. Verse eight, you shall set up the court all around and hang up the screen at the, at the court gate and you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it and you shall hallow it and all of its utensils and it shall be holy, the anointing oil, which represents the Holy Spirit of God. The sacrifice. I mean, isn't this powerful to just see God's prophetic picture of these baptisms all throughout God's word? The, the sacrifice was the thing that you had to, had to see accomplished before you could even get close to the presence of God. And Jesus in John 10 verse 9 said, I am the door. Now you don't come to me through the ritual sacrifice, the shedding of blood. You come to the Father through my shed blood once and for all. Come on, that's good news. The sacrifice, the washing of water, the anointing of the oil. Look at Matthew chapter 3. And John is speaking of Jesus. John is speaking of Jesus. John the Baptist is speaking of Jesus, and he says, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater I'm not even worthy even to be his slave or carry his sandals. And watch what he says of Jesus. He will baptize you, that's us, with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And in Acts chapter 2, we see it fulfilled. The people of God gathered together on the day of Pentecost, which Pentecost, by the way, is a word that means 50, and this is 50 days after the, the resurrection of Jesus. And this is fit, and, 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 and Moses received the, the um, um, Ten Commandments from God 50 days after the Passover lamb. It's just amazing when you see how God has put all these things together all throughout the word. And that's the day that we pick up the story in Acts chapter 2, where it says, When the day of Pentecost came, 50 days after the cross, they were all together in one place. And listen, can I just tell you, don't miss that part of the passage. They were together and in one place. Don't miss that they were gathered together in unity. Psalm 133 says how good and how pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. In spite of our differences, the way we see this or that or the other, when God's people gather together in unity under the name of Jesus, watch what Psalm 133 says, it is like precious oil poured on the head, running down the beard, running down on Aaron's beard. It's like the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So they were gathered together all in one place. Another translation say, all in one accord. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind, other translations say rushing wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest upon each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. What a powerful scene. A rushing wind and tongues of fire resting upon them. John said, there's one coming. I'm not even worthy to tie his sandals. There's one coming. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Listen, more than anything, 
I mean, I believe this church, I believe this more than anything. Once again, we need the fire of God to burn in the hearts of, in our hearts, the hearts of men, the hearts of women, the hearts of young people. We need to lead them to an experience and an encounter with the living God, a relationship with the Holy Spirit that transcends a belief system or a religious system or, or even church participation or attendance. We need the fire of God to once again burn in our hearts. And perhaps there, maybe their wants in your life was a flame and today's the day that the Spirit of God comes to breathe upon that flame to stoke the fires of your heart and cause the fire of the Holy Spirit to burn for Jesus in a fresh or a new way once again in your life. And I believe that the church at large has largely become like the church in Revelation 3. Much of the church has grown to become lukewarm. And listen, we can't control what other churches, how they respond, how they live, how they pursue the things of God. All we control, can control is what, what we are willing to do. But is it possible that this has even affected us some? Revelation 3, verse 14, these are the words of the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the ruler of God's creation. He says, I know your deeds, you're neither hot nor cold. And I wish you were either one or the other. Really, God, you wish that we would be cold instead of lukewarm? Yeah, because lukewarm is a comfortable, mediocre place. And if you were cold, at least there would be a chance that you would realize you were far from God and run towards him. He says, I, I wish you'd rather be cold than be lukewarm. We cannot afford to be lukewarm. We need the fire of God to once again burn bright in our life. Listen, I don't know who I'm preaching to, but is it possible that right now some of the struggles that you're having, the doubts, the fears, the, the, the strife in your life is because you've allowed yourself to drift to this place of lukewarm Christianity. And today, the call of God, the message of God, the prompting of God, the invitation of God is to once again say, Lord, you're the giver of the flame, but I'm the keeper of the flame. Paul wrote that to Timothy, fan into flame the gift of God that is in you through the laying on of my hands. Maybe today the Holy Spirit is reminding you or revealing to you that your light, your fire, your flame has grown dim. And today, the call of God, again, the invitation of God, not the obligation, but the opportunity and the invitation is to say, Lord, I don't want to be lukewarm. I can't be the husband you've called me to be when I'm lukewarm. I can't be the servant of Christ you've called me to be when I'm lukewarm. I can't be the father or the mother. I can't be the difference maker in my workplace. I can't be the salt and light, the hands and feet of Jesus in the way that you've called me to be, in the way that our city and our nation and our world desperately needs the people of God who are called by his name to be. They're looking for someone who's burning brightly. They're looking for something different. Our God is a consuming fire, Hebrews 12, 29 says. He's a consuming fire. Come on, he didn't desire, he, he desires to consume all of our being, all our mind, heart, soul, and strength. And listen, this isn't a weird life. This is a victorious life. This is an abundant life. Walking in a relationship with the Holy Spirit is not mystical, creepy, or spooky. It's walking with the fullness of who Jesus is and who the Father is, real time, present time, the helper, the advocate, the comforter, the friend. We've got to, listen, Maybe there have been some people who have mistaught or misrepresented what it looks like to live in a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Listen, there are some people who have misused money and abused money and mistaught on money. Does that mean that we should say, well, I'm just done with money? I'm going to start volunteering for my job because I don't want to risk Maybe making some of the same mistakes that other people have made, we can't allow the errors of some to cause us to shrink back from walking in and pursuing the fulfillment of what God has in his heart regarding the Holy Spirit, this person of the Holy Spirit. We need the fire of God in our hearts, in our homes, in our marriages, come on, in our pulpits, in our churches. Spurgeon said, put some fire in the sermon or put that sermon in the fire. We need some fire in our lives. We need the fire of God in our youth group. Young people on fire for God, not coming because it's pizza night, but coming because they want to encounter the Holy Spirit and they want to minister to one another and they want to make famous the name of Jesus on their campus and in their locker room and wherever the Lord would take them, we need the fire of God. I, I came across a study that they conducted four or five decades ago. I think it was actually in the 60s. They realized that the redwood trees, these great sequoia trees in the forest of California were no longer repopulating. 
The trees were beginning as they died off and they lived to be over 3,000 years old. But as they were dying off one by one, what they recognized and realized is that there was not another generation being raised up in the place of the ones that were passing away. And they began to look into it. It baffled them. They didn't know what to do. And here's what they discovered is that through decades of modern fire suppression, We thought we were doing them a favor. We were suppressing the fire. But what they realized is that the fire was needed for the seeds of this mighty tree to find its way into the ground, to take root and to spring to life and begin to birth a new generation of mighty trees. Listen, is it possible that out of a desire to be seeker friendly or not to step on anyone's toes, we've suppressed the fire of God and it's leading us to the place where there might not be another generation to stand into the place of people, many, many mighty men and women of God who once were fire-breathing, spirit-filled evangelists and apostles and prophets to the nations. We need the fire of God once again in our pulpits, in our youth group, in our homes, in our hearts, in our churches. We need the fire of God. It says a flame rested. A flame rested upon them. It's not weird or out of control. You don't have to be afraid of what will, what will happen in my life, you know? God never makes you do something that's against your will. I mean, I'm just telling you, you're not gonna respond today to the Holy Spirit and all of a sudden just become a weird fruitcake or nut. <laughs> I mean, you need to settle that today. You're just not. You're, I mean, God is not gonna come and start forcing you to do crazy, weird stuff. He might lead you to some faith-filled, bold steps, adventurous steps that you wouldn't have the courage or the willingness to do without the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And if that's weird, then sign me up. It rests upon them. It's an internal fire that fuels us to live our best life for God, to selflessly love our spouse and our families, to serve those around us, to further the gospel, to fulfill the purposes of God. Peter was once scared and frightened, intimidated. Remember, Peter was frightened by a school-age girl before he had the power of the Holy Spirit. Weren't you with him? No, that wasn't me. When he got the power of the Holy Spirit, he couldn't be locked up or shut up ever again. We need the fire of God in our lives. Fire of God, the fire of God. Listen, when God uses this kind of imagery, it's because he wants us to see something. And when you think about fire, the same flame incinerates the rubbish of great cities and powers the plants that bring light, warmth, and comfort. The fire of God is intended to burn away the things in our lives that are not God's best, to make a room, to make a way for the, the life of God and the power of God and the life of God to begin to flow, not in our own strength, but because of this fire that burns on the inside of us. Listen, I, I don't know about you, but I'm aware, I'm desperately aware of where I can drift to without the fire of God burning in my life. And so is the Apostle Paul, this man who wrote two thirds of the New Testament, by the way, never walked personally with Jesus. He wrote it all because of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Don't limit what you can do. If you might say, well, if I had seen Jesus or walked with Jesus or whatever, Paul never walked personally with Jesus. Everything he did, everything that he wrote about Jesus, testifying about Jesus, establishing the foundation for the New Testament church that you and I are now a part of was all inspired by the Holy Spirit. Do not limit what God can do through you when you receive the fullness of the gift of the Holy Spirit. But Paul was aware, the same man that said I was more than a conqueror, the same man that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament also said this, wretched man that I am. I think he was aware of just how quickly he could get into his flesh when he wasn't allowing, when he wasn't tending, when he wasn't caring for, when he wasn't taking care of the flame of God in his heart. Don't you stand to your feet this morning. Let's prepare to respond. There's a few ways I want us to respond today. In a moment, I'm gonna give us all the space and the opportunity to buy faith from our hearts and maybe with the lifting of our holy hands. A posture of surrender, a posture of receiving. Because the Bible says that if you know how to give gifts, how much more will your Father freely give those who ask for the Holy Spirit? 
I mean, he's not holding back. He's not waiting for you to get your life right before he's willing to give you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what comes into your life and begins to help you. He's the convictor of sin. He's the, he's, he leads you into all truth. To begin to just call out, to say, Lord, I, I receive the gift. I'm sorry for the, maybe the ways where I've taken that gift, the most amazing, the perfect gift, and maybe I've put it on a shelf. Maybe I've put him on a shelf. Maybe I've put him in my closet. Maybe I've, I buried him in the basement. I, I, whatever it is, I mean, you can picture, you get that gift. He's saying today, unwrap the gift. Receive the Holy Spirit is what Jesus said. And in a moment, we're gonna take that moment all across this room because here's what I believe. Regardless of where you're at in your understanding of or your relationship with the Holy Spirit, today there's more. Today there's more. Today there's more. If you've been walking with the Holy Spirit for many decades, today there's more. If this is a new revelation, a new teaching, a new instruction, a new opportunity, a new invitation to you because of the way you were raised, the church you were brought up in, or just a lack of faith, or maybe you've just never heard it presented this way, today there's new, an opportunity, fresh and new. I believe every person today, the heart of God would be for us to experience and encounter to receive more of the Holy Spirit. But before we take that opportunity, I wanna take the opportunity to lead Anyone who's here today and is far from God, weighed down by the, the, the weight, the guilt, the burden, the shame of your sin, to receive the free gift who is Jesus Christ. The free gift of salvation. It's, it's, he's a free gift, it's a free gift. You don't have to earn it. You could never deserve it right now, regardless of where you stand, what you're up against, what you've been through, and what the enemy is lying about who you are. Right now, today, in this moment, I believe if you're here and you're far from God, maybe you've drifted from him. You grew up in the church. You've drifted. Life's happened. Busyness has happened. Family and all, maybe even good things have happened, and you've drifted from a relationship with Jesus. Or maybe you've never given your life to Jesus and experienced what it feels like to have that weight of that sin and that guilt and that shame lifted off of you in a way you could never do in your own strength. Listen, if that's you or you're anywhere in between, we believe you're here, not by accident. You are hearing th this message. You are hearing these words because of the heart of a good father who is longing and calling you back to a place of relationship with him through Jesus Christ. And listen, if that's you, whether you're here in this room or joining us online, right now, right now, don't wait. Lift your hand towards heaven. Say, that's me, Pastor T. I need Jesus. I need forgiveness. I need a fresh start. I need a new life. I need what the Bible talks about, being born again, being brought home, being welcomed home, being transferred from a kingdom of darkness to a kingdom of light, to a royal family. If that's you, come on, right where you are, just lift your hand. Thank you, Lord, for these precious people. Listen, if you're online and you're responding, your heart is burning, like the men and women who heard the message of the gospel in Acts chapter two, I wanna encourage you, even though there might be no one around you, to stand to your feet and lift your hand towards heaven. You're not responding to a preacher, you're responding to a savior. And listen, for all the precious people who lifted their hands in this room, there were a few and online, I trust that there, there are some of you responding. We're gonna pray this prayer with you. We're gonna pray this prayer with you. We do it every week. We do it for two reasons. One, to quickly just come alongside you as a, as a church family and say, we wanna stand with you, encourage you, strengthen you in your fresh or new walk with Jesus Christ. And two, it's because it reminds us every week when we pray this, that even as we're growing in our faith, we never graduate from grace. We still need the work of the cross. We're working on our salvation and we are still fully dependent upon the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so come on church, repeat this after me. Come on, pray it with fresh passion from the Holy Spirit in your heart. Father, in Jesus' name, I recognize my need for a savior. And I thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price that I could never pay, to make a way that I might have a new life and a fresh start. And I give you that life, and I give you my trust. And because of Jesus, because of the cross of Jesus, I'll never be the same. I'll never be the same. Come on, can you rejoice with all of heaven? When one person comes home to Jesus, the heavens rejoice, the Bible says. The Bible says the heavens rejoice with even one person. Now I want us to begin to respond. 
right where you are, would you just bow, bow your head, close your eyes, and prepare your heart to respond to the gift of the Holy Spirit? Again, in a fresh way or a new way, regardless of where you're at, if you're walking in a relationship with the Holy Spirit, today I believe there's more. He wants to come and, and, and reveal to you, impart to you. If there's been a divide or a gap, you've been busy, you've been distant, you've been far. Today, you realize you need more of the Holy Spirit. That fire in your life, that fire in your heart has grown dim, dormant, or even died out today, I believe that the Holy Spirit of God wants to come the same way that he did in Acts chapter two with the rushing wind, with flames that descend, that rested upon the people of God and once again begin to ignite a fire in our hearts, a fire in our hearts for Jesus, a fire in our hearts for your spouse, for your marriage, for your children, for your family, a fire in your heart for this church, for this community to see the kingdom of God be advanced in this church and in this community and in your workplace for the fire of God to begin to burn bright in your life. Worship team, begin to lead us. And listen, we're gonna sing this song and all throughout this song, whatever posture the Lord calls you to be in, I believe this is a good posture. It's a posture of surrender and receiving. And listen, how empowered you'll become depends on how surrendered you will be. God's not looking to, I mean, he, he's not limiting or holding back. How, how emptied of ourselves can we become to create the space for the Holy Spirit to fill us?